good afternoon, everyone. Um, as I said, I'm Richard Valentine Selsey, and I head up um, Savile's European Living Research Consultancy. It covers all aspects of the living sectors, from co-living for millennials, through to build to rent, through to senior housing, to healthcare, and now, from, from now on, uh, co-living for seniors as well. Which leads us quite nicely on to just a kind of scenes in terms of what are we going to be talking about? And obviously, we've already touched upon this quite a lot this morning. That there is quite a plethora of subsectors within the senior housing and healthcare sectors, not one homogenous group. There are lots of variations within this, variations within this when you go within countries, as we heard, integrated retirement communities in the UK. You have assisted living, shelter living, the old local authority delivered housing, variation of level of care, level of amenity cost and provision. You then also have what we're talking about just now, the creation of um, co-living for seniors. Um, and also what we're starting to see in the UK as well, the kind of co-housing model where you've got cooperative housing coming through where seniors are coming together to live in their own smaller communities, shared facilities with their private houses, and are looking to live more aligned with each other. I think it's come back to that kind of loneliness point that we need more than just medical care and somewhere to live. People need that social interaction, the social pressure on things to allow them to live the quality of life they want to live uh, forever. Now, the ageing population, as we're all very aware, is coming and is here to stay and is not going to change anytime soon. The graph here on your left-hand side shows you the number of 65-year-old plus um, across a number of European countries, uh, both in 2022, 2032, and 2042. Um, all these are showing anywhere between 20% to 60% uplift in the number of 65-plus-year-olds uh, over that next 20 years. If you look across Europe, we'll end up um, with about 126 million people aged over 65 by 2042. Now, where are all these people going to go? What are they going to need? Their needs are going to be different and be required. But I think it's understanding that within this sector, within these countries, there is a common need to deliver something, but that need is going to be different depending on where you are. I think it always comes back down to what we talked about here, that kind of cultural differences, what people look for, what people's expectations are. I think when you think about the senior today, they're growing up, what they expect, what they look for, is going to be very different from the senior in 10 years' time and the senior in 20 years' time. So it's making sure we're thinking ahead and pre-planning what we're going to be needing and not just saying, today's the day we're going to build this because we've always done, and moving on to what the next thing needs to be and keeping an open mind and asking people now what, would, what they like from living and what they look for next, what's going to keep them going. Now, the next slide here then looks at the problem we've now got, which we've talked about before, the acute dis the supply problem. So we've seen populations rising. We're all very well aware of this, but we're still unable to, for various myriad of reasons, deliver the type of housing we need to meet the need of this ageing population. So here we've got the number of care homes per 1,000 citizens over 65 across a number of countries, taken from the latest data from OECD, showing the, that actually the 13 countries I've put up here, only four of them have seen an increase in the availability of care beds over the last decade. Most have seen a fall down. And actually, if you look at the level of delivery coming through in lots of places, the age of a lot of stock that currently exists and the type of stock that exists, that's probably just going to get worse. We're not seeing the huge influx of investment we saw probably in the 50s and 60s, especially in the UK, where you saw a lot of government money going in to build all these stock. That's not coming through at the moment, and we're going to see the slow drip feed down as you get uneconomical, unenvironmentally friendly stock falling out of the market as it's no longer viable, no longer meets the current regime and the current regulations we have. So I think that's a key challenge for everyone in this room to think about and to lay back to your local governments, your local policymakers, what your challenges are to do this. Because without doing this, this is only going to get worse. And we need to find other ways that are going to make it better by going forward. The challenge then becomes, if you do want to do this, and you are looking to go down there, it's the fragmentation point. It was raised in the um, session before. A lot of countries, there's very little concentration of ownership within the stock. So even if you did want to go in and help deliver upgrades and refurbishment in the current stock that exists to bring it up to the new energy standards, meet the new needs, well, the need to go out and acquire it from a myriad of little people, like local authorities, mom and pop landlords, who has the ownership of this and how are you going to aggregate that back up? It's much easier in other sectors to say, I can come in, I've got a platform of 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 homes that I can improve and go forward. If you've got 10, 20, do you have the financial capacity to do this? And how are we going to get that to go forward? So I think 
that's both the challenge, but also for those looking to enter, potentially the opportunity to find the places to go through where you've got this need and you've got the people looking to sell out and find something to make it more economical. Which does then bring us on to the fact we have seen the continued growth in the investment into the sector. So here you've got um, senior housing in the yellow and care homes in the red over the last decade or so in terms of the volume of investment over the kind of 13 European countries I've been showing previously. Now, 2021, we had a lovely peak there uh, as investment generally across all the living sectors went up. Um, just, under, just over eight, just under 9 billion or so of capital invested. Slight downturn in 2021, 2022 even. And not to be unexpected given the second half of the year in most markets, everyone was suddenly realizing in, inflation wasn't coming down, it wasn't transitory. There's more challenges going forward. And surprise, surprise, Q1 this year rolls around and everyone's kind of put their hands up and said, not yet, sir, so I'll wait. Um, my hope is we start getting a little bit more certainty, start to see this pick back up, and being realistic, I think that's probably going to be next year that we start to see a real turnaround and things coming back again. You especially look at some of the markets in terms of where debt rates are at the moment, until we get a bit of stability and a visibility they're going to start coming down, I think it's going to be hard for a number of investors to make the numbers stack and most people don't want to get caught out and make the wrong move. So if we can do everything we can to de-risk projects and get people involved, that's great. But I think that's the challenge we've got to face ourselves is that this isn't going to be easy. We're not going to have another, well, just put it on the market, sell, and we'll go. So if we go on to the next slide, um, we can then see the, the most active markets we've seen have been those UK and German markets, very much driving forward, um, delivering over half the investment in the last 12 months into those two markets. Um, we've seen some growth in terms of Ireland and the Dutch market. We've seen a bit more activity in the last 12 months than did the year before. But I think the interesting thing to look at is that those are the two big ones to go for, but not necessarily the ones with the largest ageing populations. You've got places like Spain and Italy, which have much larger, potentially faster growing ageing populations that create a great opportunity, but have been yet untouched relatively by the institutional capital, which I think is something we're going to start seeing changing. And we will see moving forward as the cultural differences start to shift and people no longer look to stay with their family and be looked after by their children, their grandchildren, and the expectations people will be moving and living a bit more of a free life. Now, if we think about where this capital is coming from, I think what really struck me when I was going through this to look at it was the difference from the European markets and the UK markets. So the stats here are for Europe. So 42% of capital comes from another country in the world. Majority of the European countries coming in. 28% um, from other institutions and private um, investors. In the UK, it's much more domestic-focused capital with only a handful of um, international capital coming in at the moment. Now, if we click again, we see where that cross-border capital is coming from. And surprise, surprise, given who's in the room and who we've been talking about today, a lot of it is those French and Belgian uh, REITs coming across and trying to build those platforms. Now, this is something I expect to see continuing to grow as people realise that there is the need to build a much more diverse platform, diversify your risk, diversify your opportunity by accessing new markets and going forward. It's not just a, I can do one, I'll stay here. It's like, let's roll out the best practice. And if, and there's a big if, the policies come along, as we hope to talk about this morning, to allow you to get a little bit more certainty across different markets. I think that will generally turbocharge the ability from investors to move across between the two. Now, why are investors looking at this? And very simply, it comes down to, if you look at the return profile, here you've got annualized to average annual total returns over a one, five, and 10-year period. The solid bars are healthcare indices, and the hatched ones are the all property from the same country. And as you can see, across pretty much every country, every time period, you have a stronger return profile uh, in your healthcare markets than you do in the all property, which would tend to be brought down by the cyclical flux in the commercial property markets. Now, when we did an analysis for our care, UK and European care homes paper last year, we looked at Australia and the UK and compared the performance during the last recession, the GFC, and found that actually the healthcare market was one of the only sectors that had a continual positive performance over that three-year period, whereas everything else crashed, including wider residential. So it just gives a little indication that this is kind of need that you, once you're in there, as because once you're in a care home, you're probably not going to be moving out. So it does give you kind of relative certainty, if you're doing this right and priced correctly, that you can kind of get the return profile you're looking for. So having looked through where we are, a little bit, a little bit of the rear view looking, because that's a lot of time with the only data we have, I was then posed the question, of where are we going next? What's going to happen over the next five, ten years? So 
thankfully, we were very lucky. We did our um, investor survey at the beginning of this year, um, which asked um, investors across Europe. We had 70 responses. This was done in January, end of January, early February this year. They have about a trillion euros worth of assets under management. And we asked them, from your living investment, how much do you have today? So here you've got it bucketed in terms of what proportion of their AUM is in living investments, and where do they see that going over the next three years? And the majority, about 52% of them said they're going to see an increase in the level of AUM they have in living sectors, divesting away from the commercial sectors. But the key question is, what are they going to do with that money? Where are they going to be putting it? And let's be honest, care homes is not going to be the biggest living investment for most investors. They're going to look at multifamily, which is much larger. But I think what was interesting to see was that you still had 43% of investors saying, we want to go into senior living. Almost a quarter saying we want to go more into care homes. And I think if we go to the next slide, the really interesting point is when you ask them how much capital they want to deploy into those sectors over the next three years, this is where it really pulls out the fact that while you might have a small core of investors going into care homes, the amount of money they want to deploy into the sector is by far and away much more significant than the smaller, more nascent sector we're seeing going on. So here you've got 33% of investors looking to invest between 100 and 500 million. And in an ideal world, 11% would like to invest over a billion euros into the care home sector in the next three years. Now, these are great headline numbers. It's really positive. Our investment team were very happy when I came back with the results and said, here you go, guys, here's a calling card. You can go out to the market and say, let's go and do this. Um, but where are they going to be doing it? And when we're looking at that, it's on an individual country basis, the bias probably due to our sample more than anything else was the UK and Ireland. But when we're thinking about the care homes and senior living, when we dug into the data, um, the next bit you see that actually they were looking at pan-European strategies, their core market, which kind of points towards what we saw and what we talked about earlier in terms of that need to expand outwards. But that, that sounds great. And we've seen this, lots of money. People are active, people want to do it. But no good thing comes without some challenge. Um, and there are a number of barriers. When you ask them, from the living perspective, what are the kind of core barriers that you're going to have to face to get through this? So surprising no one, because if you ask any investor at the time, they're always going to say pricing return profile is their biggest barrier because they always want more and want to pay less for it. Um, but I think the one for me that stands out is that accessibility of stock. Because without that, a lot of investors who might have a significant pool of capital to deploy and only want to write larger checks don't have the outlet to do this. So it's thinking about how we can kind of create the kind of right portfolios, the right platforms to allow this money to come in. Um, interestingly, the operational risk and regulatory risk are there, but are not front and centre of everyone's minds. But I think that is something just to be mindful of, that making it as easy as possible for someone new to come into the sector, to partner with someone who's already here, to give them a handhold and go through, is going to be one of the core parts to grow this sector moving forward. Now, we can't have a presentation uh, without touching upon the ESG, so we also asked them in this, from your expertise, what you're looking at, what are the, four, what are the things you care most about from ESG? Now, I think the first two, the fact that there's the environmental stuff first, goes back to the fact it's easier to understand what that means. There are metrics, there are rules, people look at it, they know what environmental means, they know what net zero means, they can touch it and feel it. So, social gains, it's much harder for them to understand. There aren't any fixed benchmarks to say, I'm doing very well on this. So understanding what that means, I think that's coming next. I think most of them just kind of take governance for granted. They think, if we're doing this, we're gonna be doing governance well, so we don't have to think too much about that one. It's in the easy box. But marrying these things up, when you're thinking about energy efficiency, what's available, what do we need to deliver next, we touched upon in the um, panel discussion earlier, the fact that your EPC and energy requirements in the UK are currently a C, and in five years' time, they're going to be in a B and an A. So always thinking five, ten years ahead, not just what is it today, what is it going to be if you're holding an asset for 30 years, and what do you need to do to keep that going and build to the next point. So... Just to finish off in terms of like three, three bad things, or bad, no, three challenges and three positives. So the headwinds to start with. So the first one, I think, is a, a fun for everyone's mind. You've got the financial conditions we currently find ourselves in. That's both wage inflation, um, operating cost inflation, energy inflation, inf interest rate pr pricing. Everything is just a little bit more difficult than it was 18 months ago. And it's probably going to be like this for at least another 12 months or so. So 
we need to work out what we're doing and how we can come around this, but it's a short-term challenge that we'll hopefully move on as we go along. Uh, the next one is that if we're thinking about the stock that needs to be built, the new supply that's coming on, is much more challenging to build at the moment with cost inflation running about 12%, depending on where you are in, the UK, in um, Europe. So with that, with the um, aging population in terms of workers, that's just another challenge with getting this off the ground and adding on to the cost of delivering more stock. And the third one, which we've already talked about, like an energy efficiency and ESG point. If you happen to build this in, you're adding more costs onto an already more expensive market. So in the short term, that can, I expect, will delay some projects and some stuff coming forward. But the underlying fundamentals of the sector mean that um, we're looking at the longer term, you do have the kind of three core fundamental things driving the sector. So you've got the ageing population we talked about. That's not going to go away. You're going to have more demand. There's going to be more need for more care of different spectrums. So more senior housing, more things that free up some of the housing for the younger generation to own or rent, uh, which is going to be great. Um, the supply shortage we've got is only going to get worse if we've got the short term. So long term, if you can make it work, uh, you're off to the races. And then the final one is that kind of defensibility of the asset class. We've seen the financial performance outperform other sectors. It should give you a bit more confidence to invest here, knowing that you've got a little bit more protection, a little bit lower risk return profile. So compared to other sectors, why wouldn't you go into this now? I think that is everything that I've asked.